Welcome to the Exploress. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. I've just gotten back from my book tour, which was wonderful. And thank you to all of you listeners who came and saw me on tour. I absolutely loved meeting you. But all that travel has knocked me around a little bit, which means our next time traveling hop back to the 1920s, which is all about women and prohibition, isn't quite ready for your ears. Luckily, I have something really fun to tide you over, an interview with my friend and fellow debut, Lissa Mia Smith whose novel Ravel came out last month. Described as Moulin Rouge meets The Great Gatsby, it's one I couldn't wait to get my hands on. And it's one the fantasy romance fans amongst you don't want to miss. Much like my novel, Nightbirds, it takes a lot of inspiration from history. And I loved this chat with Lissa about magic, courtesans, and all the ways we used elements of prohibition and the 1920s to help craft our fantastical tales. You can now buy both Ravel and Nightbirds wherever good books or audiobooks are sold. Now, grab a handful of gems and your shiniest leotard. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My newest boss ladies, Lydia, Samantha, and Nicholas. My newest lady president, Serena. My warrior queens, Alexis, Amanda, Kate, Ika, June, Neve, and Sloan, and Samantha. My imperial empresses, Bridget, Katie, Faye and Whimsy Soapworks, Samara, and Teresa. And my lady pharaohs, Sophie, Kate, Laura, Louis, and the fabulous Courtney's. Patrons play a huge role in keeping the show going. For just a couple of bucks a month, they support an independent creator. And they get access to exclusive bonus episodes, contests, the Explorers calendar, full interviews with guests, and more. To find out all about it, just go to my website. Hi, Lissa. Welcome to the Explorers. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, I am very, very excited to have you on the show. So your novel, Ravel, just came out and it's coming out, what is it, two weeks before my novel, Nightbirds, comes out. So we Yay! are, I, I think of us as uh, debut novel twins. Oh, absolutely. It's, very, it's two young adult historical fantasies. Yeah. Uh, with 1920s inspiration or settings. I know, I love it. And it, I think it's going to be an interesting conversation because I wrote a very much a fantasy novel set in a secondary world that takes inspiration from the 1920s. You wrote a fantasy novel that's set in our world in the 1920s with magic. And like you could not, I remember when I first met you online and I heard about Ravel and I was like, there's just no book that was ever written more for me <laughs> than, <laughs> than this particular book. And I cannot, I just was so excited. I've been looking forward to reading it so much. So thank you for coming on the show. Um, so I thought that um, we could start by having you pitch the book for us. Sure. So a uh, caveat, I'm terrible at pitching my own book, um, but I'm going to wing it and see what happens. <laughs> Don't worry. I am too. I am too. <laughs> I just had my launch party and the first question, they're like, so why don't you pitch your book? And I had three author friends with me. I said, why don't you try to pitch it for me? Like, <laughs> don't make me do it. <laughs> um, so Ravel is a young adult romantic fantasy that is heavily inspired by Moulin Rouge and set in the 1920s. It follows the story of Lux Ravel, who is the star of her family, the Ravel family's fantastical sort of circus-like show, think Coney Island in the 20s, and um, except it's set on, and so it's, it's a little bit like yours in that it's set on an island off the coast of New York, so there's a little second world-ish, but although it is in this world technically, sort of, but not really. Um, and so on the island of Charmant, um, magic flows like booze, except prohibition just hit. And the rebels are in trouble. The rebels are in trouble because the only bootlegger in town is the son of their enemies. So Lux and her family have the power to enchant their audience. And anyone who gives them a jewel, they can control what they think, feel, etc. for a short period of time until the jewel runs out. And Lux makes a deal with a little help of her magic 
with the bootlegger that she will pretend to be his girl in order to help him win the next election if he sells the Ravels all the booze they need to keep the big tent going for cheap. Enter uh, Jameson Port, an orphan from the mainland, with as few memories of his parents as he has gemstones in his pockets. And in a case of mistaken identity, he and Lux's paths collide. Uh, he starts to feel a significant sense of deja vu and starts to uncover, um, I guess, secrets about what happened to his parents while she is trying to charm the bootlegger. Uh, and they are falling for each other, but trying very hard not to. So keeping secrets from dangerous people is a very dangerous game. And it all sort of comes to a head. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us a little bit about the inspiration for this story. What drew you specifically to Prohibition in the 1920s and what made you want to really center the novel around that time? So the first idea I had for the book was really the magic system. The story really started with magic and the theme of magic in Ravel is that everything has a cost. Magic always has a cost. It's a little bit of like nothing that glitters can last. Uh, and so, and even though Ravel's magic, they use jewels and jewels are glitzy and glamorous as is in the 1920s, but there's a lot of not great stuff right underneath that. There's a lot of not great stuff happening. Uh, and so the jewels crumble as they use their magic. So it's sort of a false sense of empowerment. So it, initially I started writing it as a second world fantasy. And then about one act in, I was like, wait a second. Uh, I was really trying to challenge myself to write a novel with personal stakes and not just, but previously uh, my non unpublished manuscripts were very dramatic end of the world stakes. It was always like, oh, how do I make this important end of the world? That's how it's important. If this doesn't work, <laughs> everybody dies. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I was trying to make the stakes smaller, but equally important and getting more in the character. And I wanted it to be that, you know, Lux needs to pull this off for her family and family centered reasons. And prohibition was the it, it sort of struck me. And then I realized, wow, this fits. This has the correct vibes as the rest of the novel. This thematically fits the novel. And it poses like a, a perfect challenge for me as a writer because I'd never written anything historical before. Uh, and I like the challenges I'm writing so I don't stagnate. And then the more I dug into it, I was I was intimidated by it. And then I realized, you know what? I can still keep story first and magic first, and I can weave in the 1920s as it fits the story. This is still it's not a historical novel. It's a, it's a you know a romantic fantasy with historical elements. Uh, so it, it was really I guess fitting more uh, history into the magical tale than it was fitting, you know, fitting the story into history. Yeah, and it's interesting that you say that because it was really the same with Nightbirds. I mean, I, I had been thinking about Prohibition when I started, but I really did start with my magic system of, you know, there's alchemical magic and then there's intrinsic magic. And that's something that only girls, certain girls have. It runs in the blood and they can give it to someone else with a kiss. Ooh, I love that so much. <laughs> Every time I hear it, I get chills. Oh, I thank you. Yeah, so you have, you know, you have like alchemical magic is something that can be brewed by someone with the knowledge and clever hands, but it doesn't last long. It's fleeting. And like you said, I feel like Nightbirds also has that sense of, you know, it's glitzy and it's glamorous, but there is a lot happening in the shadows and not all of it is, is good. And there's a lot of like, a lot of that sparkle is illusion. And it's like that feeling of, what's actually behind the curtain when you when you peek back there, you know, beyond the lights. And in thinking about these girls who had magic, I knew I wanted it to be illegal. I knew I wanted there to be a prohibition, but it wasn't until I was several chapters in that I also went, oh, so I'm writing a prohibition novel, but I haven't really actually, you know, sat back and thought about like, what does that mean? You know, what are the consequences of if there's a prohibition against, except it's not on booze, it's on magic, like, what does that look like? So I really had to sit for a bit and do research and think about like, well, what were all of the consequences that prohibition, actual prohibition had, and how would that apply to girls with magic? What happens when something that is intrinsic to a woman is being policed morally and legally? And like, woo, that really just busted everything wide open for me. So how did you go about as you were thinking about prohibition and thinking about weaving history in, how did you decide, like, what did you feel drawn to and what did you decide to take and weave in and what did you decide to leave? 
Well, I'm, I'm just so struck. I'm, I'm going to get to that question, but I'm just in terms of what you're talking about, <laughs> nightbirds, my, my mind is just with <laughs> magic being prohibited. Uh, and the idea, I think what's sort of similar in both of our stories is that there's that um, feminist, feminine empowerment, but not really. And right, that's the thing with how you describe the magic, the way without having read your book, and I'm dying to. There's this idea with a kiss, right? They can give away their magic with a kiss. It almost sounds like a loss or an idea of something that is sexy, but maybe isn't sexy. Maybe, maybe uh, not. Yeah. <laughs> and that's so similar to how the Ravel's magic works too, because what a, you know, you have a group of beautiful acrobats and young men and women, and you give them the power to make anybody feel whatever they want. They just have to pay you first in a jewel. And what do people want to feel? They want to feel sex. They want to feel euphoric. They want to feel seduced. And so it has that same edge of, well, we hold the power, but but do we? We're making everyone else's dreams come true, but do we? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm sorry, I got really stuck on that. And you asked a, you asked an important <laughs> question that I have to get back to. <laughs> no, I look and I love that, and I think that's some at the heart of both of our novels. I mean, that's what really struck me when I first you know found out about Ravel, and you know, I was just thinking. I feel like what lies at the heart of both of our novels, th there's just like a lot of overlap and it has to do with, on one hand, you have power, on the other hand, you have exploitation and a whole host of other things. Like it's glitter, but it's also, you know, darkness. It's also potential corruption and who really has the power. Oh, and exactly. I love it. <laughs> and that I, um, and your question was about what drew what aspects of the 1920s, mm. um, because I do think that's a, a good segue for me, because I think that exactly is what it was. So the 1920s and full caveat, I'm history was never my thing in school. It's very fascinating to me. I think if I were to have learned history like this in stories and tales and in narratives, in diaries and journals, then I would have been much more drawn to it at an earlier age. It wasn't until later where I became mm. more drawn to it. Um, but for me, it was the idea, sort of the, um, the juxtaposition of things being free and loose and desire. And now you can date, now you can have boyfriends and girlfriends, you weren't just courted. Uh, but also, you can't drink there's a tremendous amount of judgment. There's still a tre tremendous amount of um, infringing faith sort of ruling the world. Uh, women have only been voting for less than a decade or about a decade. Um, the Spanish influenza just struck. So my story takes place, it starts in 1920. So, um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So the 18th Amendment, I was getting my amendments. Please. Just passed. I do too. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's just right. passed. Just, just, yeah. Just passed. So this is the first summer that it's in, oh, wow. in full effect. And in doing that, um, I went back and read a number of New York Times articles from the time, et cetera. And Spanish influenza just, the last wave of it had just ended in like 1919. And so there's still a tremendous amount of suffering and death. And now people just took away alcohol, which sounds small, but there wasn't therapy in 1919. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was there weren't people weren't talking about their feelings uh and it, it with prohibition it wasn't that rich people stopped drinking yeah. no only poor people stopped drinking rich people and politicians and police officers they still drank what they wanted to mm -hmm. so the uh i guess the unfairness of that and sort of how that echoes things today too Re and it fits into the story because the uh, so there are five magical families on Ravel and there's one that's always in power and that's the Kronos family. They're the one with the son who's the bootlegger, although he's not on the best terms with them because the Kronoses are time travelers and they're politicians. And they go back in time in order to change the narrative so that they are always winning elect uh, elections and always in control. And uh, so they they have used their magic pooled together, sort of like a colony of ants is how it's talked about in the books, where they each use a little bit of their magic. So it comes at great cost for every inch of time. Or let's say for every minute they travel backwards, they age 100 minutes. They can't travel forward. They can only travel backwards. So if they want to change a few days ago, they can age a year. If they want to wow. change something that happened last month, they're going to age 100 months, which is nearly a decade. So that'd be like me waking up in my late 40s tomorrow, which fine, nothing wrong with your late 40s, but I really like my 30s too. My early 40s. <laughs> mm. So they chip away at time to make sure the family's always in power and that they always have the wealth, the money, they own the land, they know when any disaster is going to strike, they know when the prohibition police are coming, they don't suffer any consequences. Where the other magical families, particularly the rebels, are always uh, sort of getting the short end of the stick. Mm. And I know that as the novel opens, you really see the Ravels struggling. You can tell that they 
are doing everything they can to keep their business running and their family together. And there's this like, um, I was struck by how there's this immediate sense of power imbalance. And I think that is so intrinsic to the twenties generally in America, especially there was such a wealth disparity. Um, and you really saw that underscored in prohibition because often the people who were punished um, were those, you know, of lower, those people who were already vulnerable populations were often the ones who were punished. Prohibition was aimed by some against immigrant populations where drinking yes. was a big part of their culture. So there was like definitely a lot of um, othering of immigrants in there. And, and like you said, it wasn't the rich and the wealthy and the powerful who were being punished. They were rarely punished. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's so true. My book two, uh, which is not set in the same world, it's a totally different uh, standalone YA romantic fantasy, but it's set in the Gilded Age, New York. And this is much more historically grounded. I'm still very much I'm drafting, but I keep the research is just, I got very obsessed with this research. But a big, <laughs> a big part of it that keeps uh, uh, sticking out to me because of Ravel is the way that alcohol is discussed mm. in print, in very reputable journals and newspapers, uh, or even from very famous people, uh, you know, in history and the way they talk about it in their journals and diaries, in print, uh, just such a bias towards how immigrants drank, how Germans drank, how um, Irish, the Irish drank, mm -hmm. uh, how the Italians drank and the food they ate, et cetera. But it's, it, there's clearly an, an other in terms of alcohol use. And I could see how this, the seeds were set. Almost all, all of the suffering of the people who were not rich, which was more than half of New York, of course, the vast mm -hmm. majority of New York, was blamed on alcohol. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm interested, too, in talking about, um, you know, Ravel was took a lot of inspiration from Moulin Rouge, one of my favorite movies uh, ever, ever of all too. time. <laughs> um, and this is another thing I think that our novel share in common is there's this question about um, what it means to be a courtesan or to serve a role that feels a lot like it could be a courtesan role, like women finding power in both magic and sexuality, but also like dancing a tightrope, um, you know, a dangerous tightrope and doing that. So can you talk to us a little bit about, about how you did that and what you were thinking about as you crafted that narrative? Yeah, you really nailed it. That's exactly the tightrope I felt like I was walking while writing this and various versions, various drafts fell, fell on different sides of this. Uh, so there was a point where I tried to, I said, this is leaning so much towards more adult themes. I'm going to try to write it adult. I'm going to try to rewrite it as adult and make them actual courtesans uh, that my voice is still too YA and the characters are still too YA. So then I had to bring it back mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, the idea of of feeling like you have power and feeling like you're in control because you're offering a product. You have a service that people are lining up down the block to experience and your service is to make people, you, you can control exactly what they feel in Ravel. But in order to do that, they need to pay you and they need to pay you a very particular way. And the longer you keep their fantasy alive, the m smaller your profit. So if you want to afford costumes, if you want to afford food, if you want to pay them, you know, feed the mouths of the other 96 rebels because it's a very, very large family with a lot of children and grandchildren and great. There's a whole, a lots of generations of people whom Lux feels are relying on her to earn the most because her magic has a little bit of a twist and she, her magic doesn't follow the rules. And so she is the star and she feels the pressure of making the most. But in order to do that, you have to find the perfect line of how much do I give this customer? And that's where booze comes into it because if people are drunk, it's a little bit easier to make their fantasies come true. It's more realistic. You don't have to work so hard to have make them loosen up. If you use your body a little bit, if you touch, if you kiss, et cetera, then it feels much more and you can, you can profit more, but at what cost to yourself mm. and how the Ravel's put their own out there, how they put their grandkids in these situations. It's, it's messy and it's not a comfortable thing. Um, and I don't think that everyone will love that, but the Ravels don't love that. That's it's on purpose. Yes. And I was thinking about that a lot as I was crafting Nightbirds because they are essentially magical courtesans. They are kissing people in exchange for money and also in exchange for protection. I mean, there are a group of girls who are told you have this rare gift and it's, you know, you are gifting it to other um, noble 
houses basically like they're these this collection of houses called the great houses and they're the rich and the powerful and they've always protected the night birds and it's this deal they have that you give your magic to members of the great houses and they keep your secret they keep you safe and it's a privilege to be a night bird and it's passed down through the families from woman to woman and then you know after a couple of seasons as a night bird you're going to marry some eligible great house bachelor and you're going to have oh. babies and it's going to be passed on through the generations and this is fine and it works for everyone it's not exploitative at all <laughs> oh my goodness i just got chills i hate it in the best way <laughs> yeah exactly and i think that's you know that's something that you and i clearly both had to grapple with it's this feeling of like this feels i mean it depends which way you turn it it's it's like it could be and and all of my characters all three characters are coming at the system with very different perspectives on it one is like you know she's fully indoctrinated her grandmother all the women in her family were night birds she's like this works I love being a nightbird. Like this is this is my mm. thing. I wish I could do it forever. I don't want to marry someone. Um, I want to just be this forever. And then you have other girls who are from outside the system or a few steps removed who are like, mm. <laughs> you know, I don't love this, but I'm doing it because it gives me some kind of freedom, or it gives me money, or it means I can make sure my family doesn't struggle. And so you have on one hand the system where these girls are coveted, they're protected, they're they're treasured but mm -hmm. they're also magical courtesans and that can be a really dangerous situation a vulnerable situation and it takes you know one of the things that i navigated early on i too when i first started writing was like you know i'm dealing with some adult themes here and i i toyed with the idea of well maybe it's more than a kiss maybe mm -hmm. sort of the more physically the girls give to their clients the more magic they impart but then I thought, much like yourself, I was like, yeah, but my voice and these characters and what I really want is to write young adult. And I'm not sure that that's going to like float. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to. And I also realized that I didn't want it to be about the physical act as much of the they're giving away some piece of themselves to someone else. And there is real power in that. But there's also vulnerability and there's weakness in that. They're told that what makes them special is what they can give to other people. So it's a big, right. it's, you know power defined by this system by these great houses it sounds like this this coveted role was set for them and it feels nice to be in the spotlight but is this really what i want and is this really how i would choose to take this power yes uh, yeah it's not comfortable it's not supposed to be comfortable and even uh you know lux in the story she she's the only character that we hear from point of view wise who's a rebel but she is indoctrinated she this is her family and she loves them and she loves the way things are to the extent of this is what she knows this is all the people she loves think this way feel this way etc and she thinks she never wants to leave and then we kind of as the story goes on that changes a bit um or we sort of get she is able to be more honest with herself as she gets to know other people mm. but the idea of what what defines happiness and what what's our understanding of what power is yes especially for young women right like these especially are these are young them. female characters who are trying to grapple with who am i in the world who am i within my family outside of my family and what what is power um you know like <laughs> it's a lot of big questions and big questions that teenage girls grapple with all the time like being sexualized being viewed as an object and for what you know what can you do for me um and and navigating that and finding their way through that and what's okay and not i mean so yeah it's not comfortable and it's not but it's real but it's real it's real and it's very much what the roaring 20s were about too because this was one of the first times right that at least in mm -hmm. modern history that girls and women are allowed to you know flaunt their sexuality and cut their hair and dress a certain way which that was a surprise in my research especially when when we first when i got my first cover sketch and they're like, here's Lux in her 1920s splendor. And I'm like, oh, that's like a sweater suit. <laughs> 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 it's not that revealing. You know, the 1920s were, it, as the decade continues a little bit more so, but 1920 in particular was still very much like a, yeah. a sweater dress situation. Oh, totally. Um, yeah, the hemlines were almost still down to, they were like three inches above the ankle. Horror. Yes. But that's as far <laughs> as they went, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. With stockings and with pump shoes. Like they were oh, yeah. very, yeah, the stiletto wasn't there yet. There were, these were pretty 
modest by our standards, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, this was, I think, a very, probably a, a very confusing time, which I think still echoes today, where we can be told, yes. you can do anything, you can do anything, you can do anything. And then the reality of that is, but can I? Am I actually allowed to do anything? What's the repercussions of doing anything? Yeah. And, you know, one of the really fascinating things for me in researching what life was like for women in the 20s, there was this whole thing about how, yes, women could go out and they could drink and they could, you know, they weren't stuck at home, but they also weren't making very much money. Like there was a, still a huge pay gap between men and women. And so there, it, this whole system of treating you know, developed where women, you know, girls, if they wanted to go out and have a good time, they had to go on dates, which sounds fun. But there was this like inherent expectation about what am I going to get for taking you out on the town? And so suddenly girls had to navigate this kind of like fraught sexual politics. And that could be a really dangerous space to be in. Whereas like, you know, in the Victorian era, Edwardian era, there wasn't any of that. There was less freedom, but there was also more protection. And so that actually, you know, women didn't have as much freedom in certain ways, even though we tend to think of it as this really freewheeling, you know, independent time for women. Eh. It's such a good point. And that right there, that's the giving away their magic in a way, right? Like they, yes. there was a cost. There was a cost to not being stuck at home. And in 1920 in New York, the at 18, uh, more than 50% of women were married already. Uh, I think most, the majority of at uh, 18 were married and having their second child. Wow. So <laughs> the, the people that were out, at least in the early 20s, and I doubt it changed that much throughout the decade, uh, were very young too, very young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and having to navigate those things at, at such 13, a young 14, age, yes. right? Yeah. Yes, yes, because they're getting, in New York, they were getting married at 16 and they were having children, 15, 16 and having children almost right away. Yes. Yeah, it's wild. It's it's amazing to me how much you think you know about an era, especially I feel like the 1920s are so glamorized and we've seen them on the screen and it's like, oh yes, you you know what it is to have lived during that time. But then you actually dive in and you're like, oh no, this is a lot more complicated. <laughs> of course it is. It's a lot more complicated and different than I thought it would be. Absolutely. And then figuring out how to balance that and still tell a good story, right? So there are yes. ice included things that are uh, synonymous with the 20s in people's minds that really happened later in, later in the 20s, because the Roaring Twenties were not quite roaring in the summer of 1920, the first summer of Prohibition. Um, but I, you know, let them wear their flapper gowns and let them do their hair a certain way, because that is what makes the 20s fun in our minds. This is a story being read by people in, in the 2020s. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had to sort of not necessarily cheat, but uh, not be as historically accurate as I might have been because the expectations, one of readers, but also just to get those vibes that drew me to this decade in the first place mm -hmm. were that they they looked a certain way and the music was a certain way. Let's talk a little bit about drinking in Ravel. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that there are magical cocktails. Oh, is there that are magical cocktails. Yes. That yes. Is Another thing our novels share in common that I'm <laughs> oh, very excited right. to talk about. Yes. Yes. Uh, so in Ravel, there's uh, um, the Effigen family that's a magical bloodline with the power of potency. So they can create a blueberry, for example, by combining a dozen blueberries, they'll form one that has the flavor and intensity and color of a dozen. But the 11 others crumble and turn to dust. So it's wasteful, but hey, great blueberry. But why in 1920 would someone make a delicious blueberry when they could make booze? So what the Epigen family does is they sell magical cocktails, but to save money, not every magical cocktail is going to be this, as strong as six cocktails. So it's a bit of Russian roulette. You buy an Epigen cocktail and you don't know, is this a dud? Is this just a regular drink? Or am I going to hallucinate because this is 12 drinks in one? Cool. Uh, and yeah, in our story, Jameson, when he first enters Ravel and he's again, he grew up in a religious orphanage. He is you know, he's had been with one girl in his whole life and he thought they were getting married because she was nice to him and he just got out of an old boy orphanage and like he knows nothing about the world. He's very naive and he uh, and the effigies have horns. It's like a, a unique feature of them. So it's the rule is you just never buy a drink from a horned bartender. Uh, and first thing he has to do is buy a drink from a horned bartender because <laughs> there's also mind readers. And if you have effigy cocktails, they can't really hear your thoughts so clear. And if you have secrets, you got to stay drunk. <laughs> amazing <laughs> when the police are around so so those are the the, um, the magical cocktails in Ravel there there's uh the bee sting which you feel like they're you have bees rooting you on and buzzing in your ears 
there's and showing you where to go and uh there's the gold digger and there's a few others there's some good ones that's amazing <laughs> i love that <laughs> Oh, what about a night yes. oh, wouldn't you just love to have a magical cocktail i want nothing more in my life than that <laughs> I, and you know what at my at my speakeasy after party to my lunch um the bartenders did they they weren't hallucinogenic but they did uh rename some of their cocktails for the ones in the book which was really oh, fun so i got to so have sweet. a beast thing that i did not hallucinate buzzing in my ears <laughs> But you could, yeah, you could pretend. It was a nice thing. I could pretend, yeah, for the best, probably. Uh, yeah, I had a great time coming up with my alchemical cocktails. So, you know, a lot of the alchemical magic in my my made-up place is, um, is, is bootleg. So it's run by the Sandpiper gangs, they're called, of the city. And so you have these really, really cool illicit underground clubs where you can go and hang out with the gangsters and drink amazing drinks. Um... I just, for me, because there is, there are two kinds of magic, there's alchemical and intrinsic, and I really wanted the the magic that the girls had to be the most potent, the rarest, the, you know, to have the most impressive effects. So I had to really be careful about how fantastical I made my cocktails. <laughs> so they're the kinds of things like uh, Clockman's Bane will make everything appear to slow down for a couple of minutes. What else you have? Um, Viper, which will give you like a forked tongue for the evening. So some of them are just <laughs> about like looking cool. You know, you also have not necessarily cocktails, but uh, drugs you can take, like one called Cat Eye, which will give you very good night vision. Um, what else you have? Uh, one called Fair Maiden, which makes your skin glisten. Oh, I love these. Yeah. I love them all. <laughs> I know, right? Four ton and glistening skin. Yes, <laughs> line them all vision. up on the bar. Yes. And I also have, um, there are trickster tailors, they're called. So there are tailors who essentially can use alchemical magic to like give you a dress that changes color when someone brushes it or um you know if you have like embroidered an embroidered tiger on your shirt it will like roar on command that kind of thing but for me it was all about it being much like the effects of getting drunk it's fleeting if you have too much of it it's uh not good for you <laughs> and also <laughs> i played with like there was a lot of bootleg especially later in the 20s that was very badly made that had horrible ingredients in it that would make you go blind that could kill you mm -hmm. um and so i also was playing i played a bit with that and the idea that alchemicals and cocktails that are well made are fine although they are you know addictive you can get hooked on one um but also they might kill you if you don't get them from a reputable source so you also see like that disparity again of if right, you have the money and you have the privilege and you have the, the hookups you know like you're golden but if you don't things could end badly for you and that's where prohibition is a tale of two cities in a way so in researching about the 1920s, were there, or just, you know, trying to like get into the vibe for writing Ravel, were there any movies or TV shows or, I don't know, uh, nonfiction books that you consumed that you felt were really formative? Less so movies or TV shows. And as you say that, I was like, ooh, that might have been a good idea. <laughs> but I was just, <laughs> I was reading so much. Um so I dove really into um, the New York Times has that part of their website that uh, you're nodding. So, you know, it's that time. Oh, what's it called? Time launch or something. You can go back in time and read any New York Times article mm -hmm. from any point in history. Uh, mm -hmm. So you don't have to be at a library for that, which was important because this was 2020. So libraries were shut down. And um, at least the, I wanted to go to New York Public Library and that was wasn't getting in there anytime soon. Mm. So I read a lot of articles from that time. Uh, and then there's a book I'm looking up because I probably still have it. New York Diaries. It's a collection of diaries by New Yorkers in history. And it goes by uh, by date. So they go 365 days in a year and you get a, an art, like an entry or two from different people. And it could be anything from the two thousands to, you know, real, I don't know that it goes much past the 1800s, but that was really fascinating. And that gave me, you know, a few names that I could dive deeper into. Um, one of the issues, however, was that these tended to be people who were very powerful, um, future presidents, so to speak, and things like that. So it wasn't so easy to get the perspective of what would a, a teenage girl in 1920, who may or may not be working for the circus <laughs> on a magical <laughs> island, what would she, how would she speak? 
how would the people coming to her speak? Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of things would be on her mind? That was harder to find, especially for from a woman's perspective, from a girl's perspective, a teenage girl. Mm -hmm. um, so that and then, you know, there's a lot on the web about the 20s and a lot of it probably isn't true. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, I don't know if you found this in your research, but the vocabulary was a big thing. And with each round of edits, my, you know, either my agent or my editor were like, let's add some more 1920s vocabulary. And then depending what, you know, you could find like a BuzzFeed article for talk like you're in the 20s, the bees, mm -hmm. knees, the cats, pajamas. And some of it was purely contradicting each other. And so like finding good sources for the actual language was really tough for me. Uh, especially because it wasn't as if the New York Times was using these phrases. So I had to adapt some sort of creative license and and hope for the best with some of that. Uh, but I got really stuck on that. I, I really wanted to do that, that part historically accurate. And that was really tough to not. I, I felt like if I just researched a little more, I'd find here is the Urban Dictionary for 1920. We've had it here the whole time before there was an Urban Dictionary. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, language is so tricky because when is a word actually coined? How was it used? And then the usage changes, like even the word flapper, there have been lots of uh, stories about where the, the term flapper came from. Um, and half of them aren't true. You know, like one of the one of the first things you'll read if you go online about like, where did the word flapper come from? Or like, oh, it's because flappers used to wear, you know, T-strap shoes and it was like fashionable for them to leave them unbuckled. And it came from like the flap, flap, flap noise that it made when they walked. It's like, well, and then you dig into it and it's like, mm, probably not. <laughs> like, that's a good story. And I'm sure that maybe like later people started to associate, make that association, but that's probably not where the word, you know, how that phrase actually came to mean what it meant. But language is tricky like that and especially slang. Absolutely. And a lot of it was offensive. A tremendous amount of it was offensive. Oh, yeah. A lot of, yeah. And yeah. a lot of the the catchphrases were pejorative terms for women or just uh, like terms that objectified women's and and like, you know, for historical accuracy, I could be OK with that. But this was a story that was based on we were already questioning women in, in power and um mm. And so I did not want to use terms that were offensive or objectifying women because I didn't want my characters I objectified by the boys they were talking to. These are these were the good guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, even just fine. Even when I found a more reputable source or a source that just fit vibe wise, then I was like, OK, but what words can I actually use and how do I use them without pulling the reader from the story? So it doesn't feel like I sat here with a list of 1920s words and did like a search and replace yeah, it's so I think that's one of the trickiest things about writing anything that's historical is that you're trying to engage a modern audience, t trying to stay at least true feeling to the time, but like a lot of the slang they used and obviously like the uh, <laughs> the casual racism and, and uh, yes, like, ableism, you know, <laughs> oh, all, ableism. <laughs> so many isms uh, are things that we don't want to <laughs> see in our books now, rightly so. So it's always that thing of like, how do I make it immersive and feel like it is true? to the time, but also true for our time and true for what readers and and authors want to write about now. So yeah, and that segueing from that diversity was important to me uh, mm -hmm. and having characters that were diverse and that I had the characters before I had the 1920 setting and then figuring out how that worked was really challenging because uh, so there's Lux and Jameson are both white characters. Jameson's best friend is at Ravel, and he's a, a biracial black man. Uh, so his mother is from a, like a musical family in Harlem, and his father is the head of the Ravel show. It's Lux's uncle. Uh, and so she has and so she has a few cousins that are biracial black. And his other best friend is disabled, is physically uh, disabled. She walks with a limp and uses a cane. And how they would have been treated in actual 1920. And Lux and his two, uh, I'm sorry, Jameson and his two best friends traveled to the country together before they end up in Charmont, the magical island. And how I couldn't not address the fact that this would be problematic, that this would cause problems for Roger, the friend who's biracially black, that people wouldn't have been pointing to this or been at like the most innocent level curious at the most outward level, like his life could have been in risk in plenty of parts of the country. So it needed to be addressed, but I'm also a white author and there's a, I can't, I don't want to try to write from the perspective of this is what it's like to be a black teenager in 1920 traveling the country. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where inventing an island was really sort of like a, 
a catch-all for me because I could make the rules of the island. They could New York was still very, very racist. It was better than you know some areas of the country, but it was still bad and still very segregated. Mm -hmm. um, but Charmant was not. Charmant was queer positive. Charmant made fun of what we call the mainland for like their uptight ways uh, and their backwards views on women, on race, etc. So mm -hmm. it kind of allowed me to get this, the tone of the story I had planned on writing while setting it historically. Um, but that part was really tough. Yeah, I believe it. And it's always, um, I mean, for me, Nightbirds is, that was still something I had to grapple with for sure. And like trying to create a world in which readers feel, you know, welcomed and they feel safe and they feel like they have, uh, that it's a diverse cast and people they can root for. Um, and when you make up your old, own rules in a magic system and in a secondary world, it becomes easier because you can normalize things. You can kind of like make that safe space, but it's also, it's, it's fraught. I mean, I have a mixed race character who um, features a little bit in book one and will feature a lot more in book two. And that is one of the main issues is how do I make sure to represent like this character has had a hard time <laughs> and, and, right? And, and is going to continue to have a hard time and is called and is called names and has to deal with both casual and aggressive racism on the daily. But also, you know, I, too, am a white lady author and I'm not trying to say I understand what this is, but I'm trying to do my best to portray it sensitively. So, yeah, it's 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 hard, but it's it's important to to show that diversity and especially for a, a, mine is not historical so i got to take a lot more license but like those issues are always <laughs> there for us to grapple with for sure yeah and that that's probably more actually watching things did come in handy for me so I, there are documentaries about um you know black women's hair throughout history uh and also on youtube you can find um like old shows or you know what what musicians looked like in the 1920s and what uh so there may or may not be a lot of destruction in this book. There's some very big dramatic things that happen. And then I needed to be able to figure out like, okay, if some of these characters lost everything, what would that look like? How would they do their hair? What would they be missing in this comfort sort of way? And how might that be different? How might that not have been something I would have thought of as a white woman? Uh, and yeah, it's it's a fine line, Rex. We never want to get so caught up on historical accuracy that we pull the reader from the story that way, right? Because it's still a fantasy story. You're still in Nightbirds, you have invented a new world. And so if you play too much by the rules on one hand, that pulls from the story. But if you pay, if you play too little by the rules, on the other hand, it's the same thing. Either way, mm -hmm. the reader is aware that they are reading a story and they're thinking about the decisions you made rather than being entertained, which is entertained in, in a safe way, which is the the bottom line, what we want. Exactly, exactly. And I think what I love about fantasy, and especially fantasy that has historical elements in it, which most fantasy does, is that it is a stage in which to grapple with these issues of class and privilege and race and sexism and patriarchal bullshittery. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's it's a way to do it that's safe and that's entertaining and that like it asks big questions, but it doesn't have to feel bleak. I, like, I think that's really, really, it was certainly important for me when I was a teen. And it's something that I think teens need in in their books like a safe place to play and to ask those questions and explore those issues that are so real absolutely and having them being presented and open enough that they can do their own work with it too not a not tied with a bow around it and this is how it works yes okay well i have one more question i ask all my guests this question if you could go time traveling to any time Ooh. and place, and I'm going to say other than the 1920s, since we've, <laughs> we've just spent this entire chat there, basically, anywhere for a day, walk around, where would you go? Uh, I'll go way back. I'll, and I'll go to some of the original powerful women in history. And I would have loved to see Cleopatra in action. So I would have loved to be in ancient Egypt for a day, safely for a day. So that I could see um, the original icon of both femininity and power uh, and the right, maybe not the right, but a, a good deal of viciousness. Uh, and I've never been to Egypt, just period. So I always wanted to see the pyramids. But I think it'd be really cool to go back to ancient Egypt um, in Cleopatra's court. Yes. It's funny you say that because that is always my answer. Exactly that. Oh, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I would love to go to, yeah, I know. I would love to go back to Alexandria for a day and walk through the streets and obviously be invited to go have a fabulous yes, lunch please. with Cleopatra and just like see what she's all about. Yes, I just think oh, of, of so yeah, of all the women in history, of all the places in history, that always sticks out at me as like, what a place to spend a day. Absolutely. There's a, for lack of a better term, there's a vibe to that too, right? There's just so, there's so much there that I'd want to experience firsthand, not just read about or see, but like experience firsthand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so funny. Okay. Well, I'm glad I came up with a good one then. Cause I was like, Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, if someone invents a time travel machine, you and I will go back and we'll have lunch with Cleopatra. <laughs> well, in, uh, you know, in Ravel, if we had time travel magic, unfortunately it wouldn't work that well because we would age like you know, 100,000 years or something. So mm. we'd enjoy that for all of a flash of a second, we'd be dead in dust. <laughs> details, details. We'll work that out later. <laughs> Different invent. We need invent. We need sci-fi. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Lissa, for joining me on the Explorers. I loved chatting with you. I really enjoyed chatting with you too. Thank you. This has been a true pleasure to hear about Nightbirds, especially. I'm so excited for it to come out next week. Oh, thank you. Thank you to Lissa for joining us. You can buy Ravel, as well as my novel, Nightbirds, wherever books are sold. And you can find out more about Lissa at her website, lissamiasmith.com. There are lots of ways to support the Explorers. Tell a friend about it, leave a review wherever you listen, become a patron, or just send me an email at theexplorerspodcast at gmail.com and tell me what you love about the show. I really do love hearing from you. You can find show notes for most of my episodes, as well as a list of my sources and lots of women's history goodness at my website, theexplorespodcast.com. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>